and welcome back to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marcia Franklin. I'm talking with two authors, Kim Barnes and Tim Cahill, about their own writing and also what they'd recommend that we read for this summer. Welcome back for this Web Extra. Tim, I wanted to ask you, you're the founding editor of Outside Magazine. Um, how, how has outside writing changed since then? Because the magazine is different than when you first started. It's, it's quite a bit different, yeah. Um, they've... Uh, They've gone with a, a, I feel, a bit more smart alecky type of uh, uh, thing. They, and they're more predictable. I mean, every year there's an Everest uh, thing. And then, of course, oh, I'm complaining about them. I'm probably going to be writing for them. You know, <laughs> and, 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 and you can complain about my stuff on it, too. Um, but, you know, and then they do roundups. Roundups sell magazines. A roundup is something like the 10 best outdoor towns to live in. I remember when Boise was on the cover. Well, uh, but then the next year it wasn't. Yeah. Does that mean that Boise turned into a crap hole? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a year? No. They, they just pick 10 towns and, and the magazine sells better in those towns. So where the type of writing that you did for so long, uh, where do you think that can be found these days? More online? Um, I'm thinking that, no, you don't find it online very mm, often. Like online, online is invaluable for information. Mm. It's invaluable for um, uh, following somebody day by day by day. But that's not a story. A story is something you actually stop and... Pico Iyer, who I've interviewed, you, writes somewhat, you know, like he, this as well. He does. Yeah. He does. Uh, and Pico's a friend of mine. Yeah. And, yeah I li like him too. But I don't know where you can find okay. it. And I don't know how it's going to shake out. I mean, um, magazines don't want to go more than 4,000 words mm. anymore. That's a, that's, mm -hmm. I feel constrained at that length. Um, and uh, they literally don't have any money. They're not sending me any place. Um, uh, the Africa the thing that we talked about earlier that I'm doing the, this summer uh, is, since it's a charity thing, I'm paying for it out of my own pocket. Mm -hmm. You can't imagine how that frosts somebody like me who's been <laughs> tra <laughs> traveling on the publisher's money for 40 years. Did 9-11 change a lot of things? 9-11 changed a lot of things. The, uh, uh, the Internet boom has changed a lot of things. Uh, Meaning 9-11... Uh, how did it change things for the it changed industry? things it, it changed things in that uh, advertising is the lifeblood of magazines, which I did a lot of working for, and it was thought uh, specifically right after nine eleven that Americans would not like to travel mm -hmm. abroad and and so advertisers began pulling their uh, advertising en masse from uh, uh, magazines that uh, all the travel. more reason to read magazines. If you can't, yeah. if you feel like you can't travel, why not read the story in a magazine? But I guess they didn't view it that way. That isn't the way it was viewed. In, uh, and has it made travel more annoying for you as well? The all the security measures and everything, or you just well, is that that's just the part air, of it? That's the airport. Yeah, that's the airport. What what what's happened? What's happened in travel? I I, I like to think that I specialize in remote and difficult mm. to get to places. So those kinds of things make the good part of the story. It's a lot of good places to go are some of the former Soviet republics, the post-Soviet mm. space. I should do Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. I don't know that I'd recommend it. It was one of the scariest places I ever went. I've <laughs> heard other people uh, say as much. Um, places like Azerbaijan. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, the post-Soviet Republics are just getting their, first of all, they were closed for over 70 years, so there's lots of places that you can go see, but they're a little bit wary, uh, especially of strangers coming in. You could be some kind of scary CIA, American military, somebody. Why are you drawing a map of this area? <laughs> this is near our border. Um, well, just like the hitchhiker, or hitchhikers, the hikers, on the border yeah. with Iran, who mm -hmm. say they were mm -hmm. just tourists, but then they were immediately thought 
mm -hmm. uh, as spies. And this is, you have to, you end up, the security procedures that are actually s sort of fun for me are the ones in country where you come to a roadblock with soldiers and you have to convince them that you, in fact, are not. Um, <laughs> Tim, that's it, fun, huh, with a gun that you're... <laughs> well, let's put it this way. It's a way. challenge. It, it makes for a good story. It makes for a good story is what it does. It makes for a good story. Yeah. I mean, that, this is what... You know, this, is this, the is man, what, this is the man who walked to the TV station or tried to today, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was too dangerous. Yeah. I couldn't get across the interstate. <laughs> The, but the, you can but you can sit at a guard post with somebody with the gun at you. Yeah. Well, you know, we we were looking for the uh, supposedly extinct Caspian tiger in the southern part of uh, Turkey, which um, borders Iran and Iraq, uh, uh, Iran and Syria, and uh, uh, in the area that I was in, and. You really, and they'd had a, at that point, 16 year war with the PKK, the uh, uh, Kurdish mm -hmm. People's Army. And so the soldiers didn't want to let you through, mainly because they were afraid that if you were a journalist, you were going to be writing the story that they thought of, uh, they, they thought that uh, journalists um, coddle the Kurds. It's the terrible mm -hmm. Turk, cuddly Kurd mm -hmm. story that they didn't want to write. And we had to convince them that we were writing about a tiger and that's a lot of talk and a lot right. of tea and <laughs> we're a giant clam in one of your other stories <laughs> right. kim in your in your book um in your fiction book in the kingdom of men you have a character you have to write in a male voice as well and one of them is abdullah and that character is starting to have some resentment of americans as well mm -hmm. um and in in your view you see some of the precursors in this character mm -hmm. to what we eventually saw with the hijackers in 9-11. That's right. One, of, one part of my education as I started uh, researching this was um, the incredible impact that the oil companies had as they came in and Bechtel and, and all, I mean, just trying to build the infrastructure of oil development. It was phenomenal. And this had been a closed culture inside a closed country. And when they opened those doors up, it was an amazing influx of people literally from all over the world coming to work there. Uh, as houseboys, as uh, engineers, uh, as uh, uh, East Indian men were brought in to do the books um, until the American women were discovered to be cheaper labor, so then they shipped in the single girls and kicked out uh, the Indians. Um, but what uh, one of the parts that fascinated me the most was the incredible uh, upheaval in the culture of the Saudis and the Bedouins. And Abdullah is one of those who is a bright young man who goes to work for Aramco first as just an errand boy and was bright and was allowed to come in to the schools and then was sent by the kingdom in Aramco to get his degree in petroleum engineering in Texas. And this is very common. Well, these young men, I mean, you know, the old saying, which is really kind of offensive, is camels to Cadillacs. Mm -hmm. I think you've probably heard this. Um, inside that is a story of young men uprooted. I tell the story of Abdullah's family uh, waking to the sounds of the machinery coming in to tear up the it's wadi. A, that resentment eventually. Yes, and so yeah. he comes back uh, yeah. with this education, but, and this is very true, often the Saudis who were educated would go into their position but there were certain elements in Aramco that didn't want them to know what was going on. So often they drill a well and call it water so that they didn't have to pay their 50% uh, to the kingdom. It's an interesting story, but a lot of those young educated men were then kicked back down to say being a translator. And that's the story of Abdullah. And that's, we start seeing the riots uh, during the, the, the war. Uh, with Israel, the Israel Arab, uh, Arab War, and uh, we start seeing that uh, resentment 
against the American uh, influence and uh, presence there beginning. Um, was it hard to write in a male voice? Well, it, I'm, I'm writing from Jen's perspective and in her voice, but during yeah. the conversation, I think that you're yeah, thinking of trying to figure out what a young man like Abdullah, who had left the Bedouin tent, <laughs> gone to Texas and come back what his voice might sound like was, I think, the hardest part. Uh, I didn't want, I wanted it to be true uh, and uh, true to him, but uh, so I tried to keep it simple. <laughs> well, in both your books, in all of your writings and in yours, the land is also a character, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, you know, it's omnipresent, mm -hmm. whatever is happening, whether that's dust storms or things that you've experienced Heat, cold, sandstorms, sandstorms, Shamal. <laughs> yeah. Um, as as we uh, work to a close here, I'd like to talk about some of the other books that you would like to recommend. One is called Binocular Vision: New mm -hmm. and Selected Stories by Edith Perlman. Mm -hmm. Edith Perlman uh, is I. It's my understanding she's in her seventies. Um, has been writing for all these years and look out books. Uh, found her collection of short stories to be irresistible, uh, published it, and it has taken uh, the short story world by storm. She's been awarded uh, many prizes since that time. I recommend it highly. She's a master of the form. And you would like to recommend Raylan by the great writer Elmore Leonard. Um, yeah, and it's, it's as if um Somebody asks you what your favorite dinner is. It's it's hard to tell. You know, sometimes you want pheasant under glass or something. Uh, to me, Elmore Leonard is a big juicy juicy cheeseburger. I mean, uh, he, it's uh, I, I love his I love his style. I love his uh, his philosophy. Mm -hmm. Don't write the stuff that people skip over. Well, this book in particular, or the hero in it, uh, the U.S. Marshal, is part of a hit TV series right now, I, right? I picked so it because it's his, it's simply his latest book mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, the New York Times ran a front page uh, glowing review of this book and it looked to me like what Elmore did was sit down and write four episodes of the thing where uh, of, of that show of the show uh, but they said and he's breaking new ground findings it's basically Elmer Leonard has been so good for so long he can do whatever he wants well right. we had a recommend we had a recommendation um, from a viewer from Scott of a book by Alan first which is also um, mm -hmm. kind of a, a mystery book mm -hmm. he, he actually recommends any, any of the Alan first novels set in late 30s Europe with various intrigues leading up to the war. This is the first one, Night Soldiers, a great place to start. And um, Scott also recommends a book called Kindred by Octavia B Butler. This fascinated me when I read about her. She was an African-American science fiction writer. He says it's a sci-fi novel about the nature of racism written by, he, she was his friend and lived in, in Seattle. So um, that's great. And from uh, Margaret, uh, we have a fun, recommendation. She is reading three books. Talk about uh, the Holy Grail. She's reading three books about the Holy Grail. <laughs> Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Parzival by Wolfram Eschenbach, and Percival, the Story of the Grail by Chrétien de Troyes. She says, I'm dragging my poor husband through my King Arthur phase. At least he'll get to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail at the end. <laughs> There's the Good humor point. again. And um, Here's, here's a book that I am starting uh, from Katie is the recommendation Behind the Beautiful Forevers, Life, Death, and Hope in a Mumbai Undercity by Catherine mm -hmm. Boo, a reporter, former reporter for the Washington Post. It's a tough, tough read, but picks up on some of the themes I think you've covered where mm -hmm. you're traveling, you're learning about the culture, you're learning about the people, and that includes the dark side as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting book from Melanie who used to work here, uh, The Last Letter from Your Lover by Jojo Moyes. She says, at first I wasn't sure about it, but the idea that someone after a car accident loses a short-term memory and finds wonderful love letters from some anonymous person and has to discover who this mystery love is was actually very intriguing. And I just want to make sure that we don't miss any. I think that we have covered all of our recommendations from viewers. And then as we, as we wrap up, um, you mentioned Everest at, at the beginning. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, all this tendency to have a new Everest story each year. But Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. 
Yeah. I don't know that that can be exceeded. Uh, you don't really need book. to write any more of our stories. Yeah, <laughs> that, and that's your recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, I was at outside when uh, John uh, went there, and 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 the original st story was the kind of story that outside really used to specialize in, and that is, are there too many people being dragged up that <laughs> mountain by too many um, guides and uh, and John was just going to go to base camp, but then his his his, his love of mountaineering yeah. um, changed it, and so he spent a year getting in shape so he could actually climb the mountain. But what the story was supposed to be about: Are there too many? Is something going to happen someday? Will it happen? No, it's huge. Then? And you know what's interesting about this is a lot of people say, well, I don't care about mountaineering, and especially women. And I find that this book, for some reason, appeals to women. Mm -hmm. um, women I knew when the book came out, were they all wanted to talk to me about it, and they all wanted to find out more about John. Mm -hmm. What do you think about John's revelations about Greg Mortensen? I've mind. worked with John for 20 years, and he is um, uh, he's pathologically honest and a little bit tortured. Um, this is like um, dropping an anvil on Mother Teresa. Uh, John, this, you've worked with John for many years, is that yes. what you said? She's, she's, he's very honest. So you believe his account of I absolutely of believe his account. I'll tell you what. I mean, he donated $75,000 to the Central Asia Institute, mm -hmm. which was run by... Greg Mortensen, and that money wasn't being properly used. That's enough to make you angry, and that's enough to uh, uh, write the book that John wrote. What's the future? Uh, do, do you think short, there's a future for, for I think there's for a future for um, Mortensen. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a he's a fundraiser, and what he what he did was. What he does is is good thing. It's a good thing, and I know many many people. There's a reporter for the Bozeman local Bozeman newspaper, who quit her very good job to be the public relations person for that uh, organization, not because she was making more money, but because mm -hmm. it was doing something that appealed to her. Um, the Central Asia Institute will survive, whether Greg will or not. Um, I think they're going to keep him doing what he does best, and that's giving speeches, raising money, going to Pakistan, and uh, meeting with people. But I, I really must say that if you're writing nonfiction, boy, don't make anything up. I was going to say, in memoir, I just don't understand why somebody wouldn't just say, you know, over a period of years, which is, you know, he's kind of been accused of putting together time or I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. That's that's I mean you've written memoir, mm -hmm. you know, and you're so open to criticism if you make a mistake like that. Well, it's not, Tim. Hmm. Yeah. It's it, yeah, it, it's not memoir so mm -hmm. much. As a matter of fact, um, he was just uh, uh, declared not guilty or right. in, in a civil suit right. uh, because the judge basically said a memoir that's your story. You can tell your story however you like. But if you're telling a non Three Cups of Tea is supposed to be a nonfiction book. All right, there's no, there's no way you can sue somebody for not uh, telling the truth, but how many people are going to read the next Greg Mortensen mm -hmm. book? Um, and for me, I've been writing nonfiction for almost 40 years. If I get caught in a pretty big lie, that invalidates everything I've ever done. Um, Nonfiction writers are probably more incensed, uh, and John Krakauer is one of them, are probably more incensed about that than uh, yeah. anyone else. Very interesting. Um, Kim, uh, a book that you'd like to recommend as we close is uh, when, a Ch when I Was a Child, I Read Books. This seems appropriate to end mm -hmm. our conversation. By Marilyn Robinson, who grew up in Sandpoint and who, who references her childhood in Idaho in this book. 
That's right. I mean, uh, Marilyn Robinson is not only just an extraordinary writer of fiction, um, she is a scholar, she is an incredible intellect. And so this collection of essays uh, goes from deep scholarly intellectual inquiry uh, to more than we've ever seen about her you know, autobiography going, growing up in Sandpoint. We really haven't seen that intimate of a detail. And politics. From her. She goes into she can debt do it crisis. All. And <laughs> yes, she can do it all. And it, it feels like a very important book to I'm, have from Marilyn. I'd love to meet her someday. I, Housekeeping is one of my absolute favorite books. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for staying and continuing with this Dialogue Web Extra. You've been listening to Kim Barnes and Tim Cahill, both wonderful authors in their own right. And we've been talking about not only their works, but their recommendations for good summer reading. If you'd like to see the whole list, check out the Dialogue website. That's where you'll find it. And thanks for tuning in. I'm Marcia Franklin.